Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gawlin. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Gastro Girl Podcast. Today we're going to tackle EOE FAQ mini series question number two, and we're going to explore the difference between the three treatment options, a PPI, a steroid, and a biologic. And back joining us today is the amazing Dr. Pooja Singhal, uh, who is a board-certified gastroenterologist, hepatologist, and obesity medicine specialist, and the founder of the Oklahoma Gastro Health and Wellness Center. This episode is brought to you by Sanofi Regeneron. And as always, friends, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and write a review for the podcast and the podcast episodes. Thank you so much. Dr. Singhal, thank you so much for being here again today to guide us through this important, and it truly is a frequently asked question. Patients, you know, we all wonder, what are the differences between these treatment options? Um, So we're going to jump right in and discuss these three essential treatment options for EOE. So um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's start with PPIs. What are they and how do they work for EOE? Yeah, absolutely. So PPI uh, stands for proton pump inhibitor. And it's a very, very common medication that everybody must have heard about and knows about. It refers to medications like omeprazole, which is commonly known as Prilosec, Nexium, Isomeprazole, and so on and so forth. Basically, we all have a stomach, and stomach has cell lining that has these little pumps, and they pump acid in the stomach. So these medications basically stop that and reduce and minimize the acid in the stomach. And the way it works to help our esophagus is by minimizing that acid in the stomach. So if there is any reflux, it's non-acidic reflux. So it's the acid in the contents of refluxing that causes the inflammation in the esophagus. So how does that relate to EOE? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our thought about EOE has changed a lot over 30 years. Initially, we weren't sure what was causing and triggering eosinophilic esophagitis. Now we know it's an immune-mediated um, process, uh, immune-mediated trigger, which deposits eosinophils in the esophagus, there was a point in time we thought that there was an acid, there is a role of acid as well, um, and that there is an overlap. So we do know, we still don't have a comprehensive understanding of to what extent PPI can really stop the process uh, of EOE, but we do know that taking these medications does help with eosinophilic esophagitis reduce the inflammation, the acid-induced inflammation in the esophagus, but it's not targeting your immune system. That's the big difference. So now let's talk about steroids. Um, What's the difference between topical and systemic steroids, and how are they used in EOE? Absolutely. So systemic steroids are the steroids that we know about, prednisone, decadron, dexamethasone, our medrol pack that, you know, everybody or may have some of our listeners may have experience if they get a bad cold and so on and so forth. But steroids, systemic steroids basically act um, systemically to reduce inflammation, and they're great at reducing inflammation. One component of eosinophilic esophagitis is localized inflammation in the esophagus by this eosinophil deposition. So when the eosinophil cells deposit, it causes swelling, it causes inflammation, and that further triggers, continues the cycle of inflammation and can lead to fibrosis. So In EOE, there is a role of topical steroids where you swallow and it coats the esophagus with the steroid. And it is because it's anti-inflammatory, it does help subside the inflammation. So have there been any new options for patients in this area of steroids in the last couple of years? Uh, what What should patients know about? I know we've done other episodes on this that delve into it 
more detail, but just from a high level, what are the names that patients should be aware of when they're talking with their healthcare provider? Yeah, absolutely. So over the last years, we, the big one that we use is budesonide, viscous budesonide, B-U-D-E-S-O-N-I-D-E. It's basically topical steroid, and usually it's found at a compounding pharmacy. So they mix the steroid agent with a vehicle, uh, something that you can easily swallow, and that will help coat the esophagus as it goes down. Um, and it does work. It has um, it, it does have some good data. The problem, or rather some of the drawbacks or the feedback we hear from patients with this is, um, it's hard to kind of be compliant with it because you can sometimes get fungal infection by taking it chronically. Um, and it is a great medication that works temporarily, but it's not stopping the process. It's kind of alleviating the symptoms part of it by reducing the inflammation. Oh, wow. So this brings me to my next question. This is like the struggle of patients. It's addressing the symptoms. So what what goes under the hood here? What really can yeah. help patients uh, address the true cause of EOE? Is, is this a biologic? And if so, what is a biologic? Absolutely. So, you know, biologics are a category of medications that target. The great thing about biologic is they target our immune system at a specific checkpoint where we think that's the checkpoint that's getting triggered to send the signal, hey, deposit these cells, deposit these cells. So those are biologic medications. Biologics in the past have been notorious because of their side effects, but we are fortunate that in 2024, uh, we have such modified and such smart agents, biologic medications, these molecules that have minimal side effects. And so going under the hood with eosinophilic esophagitis, as I mentioned before, we now understand it better. We now know that it's type 2 inflammation and the pathway uses T helper cells um, to trigger this. And uh, we are fortunate in the world of eosinophilic esophagitis to have a biologic agent, and it's called dupulumab, um, that came on the market now close to two years, and it has great, great data in terms of stopping that process at that targeted point. So it's stopping that process. So that's what we want. We don't just want to treat the symptoms. We want to stop the process of it infiltration doesn't happen. The eosinophil stop depositing. So we're starting it f at the point where it's starting. So uh, can you expand on that targeted approach of biologics and their role in severe or refractory cases of EOE? So patients understand absolutely. a little better. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've had patients where they have come to me where they can't even swallow a pill like ibuprofen or a person who, you know, is very upset about not being able to attend a kid's bar birthday party because there's this fear of food because of the choking and they've had to live with it and nothing is working or something is working temporarily. The reason why biologic has been so successful and is so important to know that as an option with eosinophilic esophagitis is because it goes to the root cause, the root cause of inflammation. It binds to IL-4, which is interleukin-4 and interleukin-13, basically the track points where it can stop that inflammatory pathway. And we have been so surprised as medical community to see those refractory cases of eosinophilic esophagitis or um, severe cases where like no other agent is working um, and we have incredible, incredible results. I have had so many patients uh, where we have tried so many different things in the past who they come back for their repeat endoscopy and it's like I'm looking at a different esophagus, different food pipe. Like it's shown such beautiful remission. It's almost normalization of the mucosa. 
So that has been very, very rewarding to see and recognize that there are treatment options now for eosinophilic esophagitis that have such incredible response. Now, is this just for adults or is it also a also um, indicated for children? And if so, what are, is there an age? Is there a weight to this? How, how would you explain that to patients? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it, uh, this particular biologic agent, dupilumab, uh, recently got approved for children. Um, and um, it has been used in the world of other um, immune-mediated conditions like atopic dermatitis in kids for a long time. And... Um, Yes, it can be safely used in the pediatric population. It's interesting to see the evolution of treatment options for EOE. And we know that there's a dietary intervention as well, but we aren't going to get into that in this um, FAQ because we've done other episodes that focus on the dietary treatment of EOE. But when a patient comes to you and they've, they're diagnosed with EOE, is there a protocol? Do they have to start with PPIs or can they go right to a biologic? Like what does that treatment um, choice and option look like? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And that's something that we all as a medical community are trying to come up with guidelines and protocol. Fortunately, recently at uh, a National GI Conference, some guidelines were released, but this is a changing um changing landscape when it comes to eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, but there doesn't have to be necessarily, oh, you must do this. You know, I think we have a lot of, it's left to clinical, clinician judgment, patient understanding. It's really shared decision-making, but I do encourage everybody to ask the right questions, ask the questions about what treatment options are available. Um, it is in an injectable form, so it's very convenient. You can use it self-inject once a week. Very, very convenient. And, um, you know, the shared decision making has a lot of power in it. Um, sometimes the limitations in this decision could be the insurance coverage. And the protocol, as far as you're asking, may be that insurance company is only going to cover it if you try, you know, option number one or number two, and then go that way. But it also depends on when we do endoscopy and take tissue sample, the number of eosinophils. Um, so... The big thing is not knowing full extent of what the treatment paradigm is and knowing, you know, what is doable for our listeners, our patients. If they feel like, hey, taking an oral pill is the answer for me, then we got to try that and we have to respect that. If they, they think, no, I understand, I feel like I can do this and I want to do this and it may help me with some other conditions like, you know, asthma or atopic dermatitis, which all, often has overlap with this, then a lot of patients choose to go that way. Uh, but the big thing always to remember is when you're treating um, a disease that's chronic and lifelong, you want to try to go to the root cause of treatment. You know, thank you, Dr. Singhal, for this. And you've mentioned the role of endos endoscopy and looking at the esophagus. And, you know, this is a lifelong chronic progressive disease. So the key to all of this is regular follow-up with your yes. gastroenterologist, not only to see where you are, you may feel good, but your esophagus could still show too many eosinophils. So you may need to adjust the treatment plan. This is why it's so critical. And we're going to get into the role of endoscopy in our next Q&A with Dr. Singhal. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this episode. And check out our EOE playlist um, for other episodes that dive into these various topics a little more in depth. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.